you should be able to see my screen now. Uh, let me know if you can't. And let me move this chat window into an area where I can see it. Um, okay, I'm gonna move the chat window right there. So now I have a little bit of monitor so I can see myself, I can see the chat window, and you guys can see my screen. Okay, great, perfect. So let me, and if also you guys could tell me if you guys are experienced investors, or if you're new to investing or the markets, that would be helpful as well. Um, just go ahead and make your comments in the chat and I'll, and I'll keep going here. Um, what you're seeing in front of me uh, is basically my dashboard, my Fintel dashboard. And uh, let me just first of all say, don't take any anything that you see on my screen as a, as a recommendation or, or, or kind of like any kind of sentiment about what I think about these companies. I found a lot of companies, a lot of them I don't, I don't invest in, but um, you know, you might see some stocks up here that I don't think are good, but I have many way on my board and you might see some that are really, that I, that I really like that aren't on the board. Just don't read too much into what you see on my list of stocks. Um, and also I'm not a financial advisor, obviously. So I'm not giving you financial advice. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to show you how to use these tools uh, to help you be informed on the markets. Okay, so there you go. So what you have here is a, is a heat map. You can see right now that a lot of companies are, are down pretty significantly in the last day. This basically shows you the last trading day. Um, you can adjust this heat map. You can add companies, you can delete companies. Uh, you can do stuff like this. I can say, let me add, um, let's see if I have, if I've already added Snap. Let me see ABC. I'll, I'll just click on that. And you'll see that ABC shows up here. Um, in the, in the in the heat map right away i can i can uh, and on this page basically we have news we have sec filings we have data from the financial conduct authority of the uk as well so if there are companies that are listed on multiple exchanges or or fall under the regulatory uh bodies of different countries and we're, we're trying to pull that in here now um you can see the insider transactions here and ownership transactions. So this is really kind of the summary of, of, of everything that we can, we can show you about your portfolios. Now, if you want to modify this, here's how you do it. You go to settings and you go to stock lists. And stock lists is basically a list of uh, uh, little lists that you can click on uh, and you can add or you can remove. So I can go to my follow list here. I just added ABC. I can get rid of ABC by clicking on this little X and it will go away, okay? And, you know, of these, of these lists here, when I come back to my overview, I can then click on the list here and I can pull up just that list. So this gives you a way to organize uh, your, your interests, I, I guess you could say, into different categories, all right? And, you can also do this same kind of thing elsewhere as well. So I could come over here and I could say, look at my technology list, see what the news are and so forth. Um, but most of the time, you're probably gonna wanna look at all of them. All right, any questions so far? Okay, let me know. Um, we have the ability to create alerts. So a lot of people like alerts. Um, here's an example of some of the alerts that have happened in the last couple of days. Um, this is a, a web UI, and you can see that five hours ago, I got alerted to the fact that Regency Capital Management reported a new position in stamps.com. I follow stamps.com. I also follow Google, so it's let me know that there's two new positions here. I can click through, and I can see more about this new thing. You can see here that, that Regency Capital Management uh, disclosed a new position of 902 shares. So, cool. All right, so some of these are small alerts, some of them are bigger alerts. If you wanna go take a look at all the alerts that we have, this is kind of where you would go. And so we have this idea of, of a global alerts. So this is going to be um, alerts that are going to fire if any company matches the filter. So for example, a lot of people are interested in S1 filings. An S1 filing is a registration statement. If you are if, if, if a company files an S1 filing, it means they're going to be registering uh, new securities, which means that they're going to possibly issue new securities, which could possibly dilute um, the existing securities. And that oftentimes results in a drop in the share price. And so a lot of people want to follow 
S1 filings. This will give you an email. So send you an email and it will put something in your alerts anytime a company files an S1. You can also file, you can also click on alerts for insider purchases, insider sales, uh, you know, insider purchases over $100,000. Uh, you can do merger prospectuses and things like that. So there's a lot of different things that you can do here. If you have an alert, or if you have an idea for an alert that you would like to have, let us know and we will create it for you. And we'll put it in here. Alternatively, we have these uh, kind of legacy company alerts. And this is what how we used to do it. And, and we're gonna continue to modify this. But when you sign up and you follow a company, you're going to be automatically subscribed to these company alerts. And these company alerts, um, you can't really see the granularity in here. Uh, but what we do is we'll send you an alert if there's an 8K filing, which is a, which is a kind of a, a newsworthy filing that a company has to file. We'll send you an alert if there's a significant insider trade. We'll send you an alert if there's a, uh, a, new, a new company that owns a, a, a fund that buys a new position in your company. There's a bunch of them that we think are, are important and we'll send those to you. And you can unsubscribe from them on a on an individual basis by just clicking over here, you know, unsubscribe or subscribe. Okay. So that's kind of how that works. Um, so I've talked about the overview page and I've talked about the alerts and I've talked about the stock lists. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, what I want to talk to you about on the dashboard page because we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, and there's a lot of data to cover. And I think probably a lot of people are interested in the data that we have. So with, there's no more questions on this. I'm gonna to continue to move towards, towards some of the data that we have. So let's take a look at AMC, for example. A lot of people are following AMC because of the short squeeze potential. So I'm gonna click on that link and then I'm gonna come down here. Uh, this is kind of a standard stock page. You're gonna see this kind of layout for uh, all of the stocks that we have. We have an overview, we have ownership data, we have insider data. We have short interest data, which we're gonna to go to next, SEC filings, and then some charts and financials and so forth. So if you go click on short interest for AMC, <clears throat> what you're gonna find is that we have a whole bunch of information on kind of short interest. Short interest is just, is, is, is one specific thing. In, in, in fact, for, for AMC, it's 85 million shares, but there's a whole lot of other data that goes along with short squeezes and short interest that's related to, to that that we have is in addition to just the short interest. And I'm gonna walk you down through here. So uh, we, have a, we have a short squeeze score. Uh, we, we look at you know, short squeezes that happened in the past and we look at all of the things that, that kind of the prerequisites that, that are required to have a short squeeze. And we put those prerequisites into a, into a sophisticated kind of quant model. And then we rank every company uh, with its peers uh, to figure out, you know, which ones are most likely to have a short squeeze. Now, AMC is 55 right now. Um, it's not real high. Uh, 50, 50 should be around average, uh, but it doesn't mean it, it won't change. And, and what, what happens is, is that you find things like the borrow fee rate, okay? So the borrow fee rate is, is what it costs to borrow shares in order to short them. The borrow fee rate is, is, is right now at 1.14%, which is not, not very high. <clears throat> when GameStop had its short squeeze on January 28th, the borrow fee rate, I believe was around 60%. That's an annual percentage rate. So that's very high. Uh, if the short borrow fee rate goes up then you'll see the short squeeze score go up. You can go down and look, look at, short the, at the short volume. Uh, fails to deliver is a, is a metric that uh, uh, plots the number of, uh, um, for lack of a better word, fails to deliver. This is whenever somebody tries to borrow shares and they can't. Uh, that's called a fails to deliver. And it's kind of a sign of naked shorting. Although, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of backwards looking because we don't have real-time data on this. The SEC doesn't provide real-time data, it provides historical data. So it's not particularly helpful when trying to predict short squeezes. But you can see that AMC has had a lot of failures to deliver over the course of the year. And especially around January 28th, which was the big day. Um, Institutional put call ratios. Um, institutions have to, uh, and ma many institutions have to, to um, uh, declare and disclose their their positions, and some of those positions include puts and calls. And so, 
if you if you imagine that a put call ratio is is an indicator of sentiment, this kind of gives you a sense of <coughs> what institutions think of this company. In this case, it's actually below one, which is a positive bearish indicator. And we'll come back to that in a bit. I'm sorry, positive bullish indicator, okay? Uh, here we have the short interest uh, and short interest uh, official New York Stock Exchange data. <clears throat> the New York Stock Exchange publishes short interest every two weeks, every actually, you know, so does the NASDAQ, so does FINRA. Um, so we'll give you uh, on this date, the short interest and the change and their reported days to cover and, and so forth. But <clears throat> we also give you data on a daily basis. The short interest doesn't change on a daily basis because we only get it twice weekly, I'm sorry, twice monthly. But the days to cover is, is the short interest divided by the average volume. And, and that changes every day. And the higher this number, uh, uh, you, you'll find that it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's kind of, and many people believe it to be a predictor of, of a short squeeze. Uh, what this means is basically that if, if every company that had uh, a short shares uh, had to go out and buy shares on the open market right now in order to cover their, their, their positions, it would take them a full day and, uh, and, a, and a couple hours to be able to buy enough shares to cover, okay? <clears throat> so that's what this means. Um, and then, of course, we have you know shortages percentage of float, which is pretty elevated right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me give me one second. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. So, and then we have um, funds disclosing short positions. A lot of funds uh, are dis are required to disclose their short positions, and we give you all that information right here. A put, of course. Uh, uh, owning a put is in fact a short position. And so we'll give you all the funds here that have that have disclosed puts that we have data on. Uh, and you can see that there's 40 of them here. So any questions about the short interest so far? There's a lot of data in here. Uh, we try to be uh, as transparent as we can and try to provide you as much as we can uh, in regards to short interest. Uh, there's a lot to digest, but hopefully this will at least give you a sense of like what it is and, um, and how it can be used. Um, what is the number one factor for short squeeze? Well, it's this, there is no number one factor, right? So we, we combine, uh, uh, let me take that back. The, the, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, the number one factor is probably the borrow rate. The borrow rate, because if you're, if you're, if you're um, shorting a company, you're, you're, you're borrowing shares and you're paying a fee uh, to borrow those shares. And if the borrow rate goes way up, then that means that the cost to borrow suddenly becomes very expensive. And if the cost to borrow goes way up, then that means that the likelihood of you getting a margin call goes way up. And the likelihood, if, the likely, if the likelihood of a margin call goes way up, then that means the likelihood that you're going to have to buy shares on the open market to cover your shares goes way up. So I think that if you, and, and if there's not a whole lot of shares, then, then these are all things that kind of precipitate a short squeeze. So I would say that it's, it's probably very unlikely to have a short squeeze if you have a low borrow fee rate. Um, now, the question then is, is how do you, is this even true for hedge funds? I don't know what that means. This is even true for hedge funds. What is low borrow fee? Well, I mean, it, 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 it's variable. 1% is definitely a low borrow fee rate. 20% seems kind of high to me. It, think of it as an APR, right? Like what is a, what is a high rate to take out on a mortgage, right? Um, it's all relative. So if you take a look at the short squeeze explorer right now, which is something that we built, it's a nice segue. Do hedge funds have the same interest rates? Yes, yes. This number here, this borrow fee rate comes from Interactive Brokerage, which is a prime broker, and they provide, they publish their, their fee rates, their borrow fee rates, and these are the borrow fee rates that anybody who uses Interactive Brokers must pay in order to borrow the shares. So, you know, it's going to change, this, this number can change 
it, it actually, I've seen it change throughout the day uh, from, from numbers in the fives and 10% to 50 to 75% just in one day and then come back down. So, and you know, the prime brokers are all going to be competitive. So, you know, I, I personally believe that, that, that this is a good indicator, even though it just comes from one broker, it's actually a, probably a pretty good indicator of what the entire market looks like at any given point in time. Uh, so yes, the hedge funds have the same interest rates. Um, but if you take a look at this, this is the short squeeze explorer. We, uh, as I said to you before, every company gets a, a score that we put through a, 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 a scoring model. And if I click on the highest ranking score, then you can see this number here. You can see the short squeeze score ranges from zero to 100. The borrow fee rates, I can sort on this. I can see somewhere as low as 0.3 and somewhere you know, this one is 273%. This is an indicator in many ways of a um, hard to borrowness, you know, if you want to call it that. But, um, and, and again, this changes throughout the day. But it's not just this. The, the um, in, in addition to having a high borrow fee rate, you also have to see typically an increase in prices. So you're going to see a price run up. So we look at price momentum as a factor. We also look at volume momentum as a factor because if if there's no volume and the borrow fee rate is high, then it doesn't matter because people aren't the, the shares aren't hard to, to acquire. But if a lot of people are buying the shares, then people who have to cover have to then compete with other people buying the shares. And so, you know, we looked at GameStop and, and we looked, you know, and, and we've said what, what are all the things that happened during the GameStop short squeeze? That precipitated that that short squeeze, and this is kind of how what we came up with. Um, and also, short interest as a percentage of float is a factor because it's it's um you know this is kind of a, a sense of an indicator of how how much of the shares are actually how how what percentage of the of the publicly floatable shares are actually being shorted right now. So I hope that answers your question. Um, I'm going to keep moving on here. But if you have more questions on it, I can I can come back to this. Um, there's a lot of factors. Borrow free rate is certainly one of the most important, but you can't also, you cannot ignore price momentum, volume momentum, and the short interest percentage of float. Days to cover uh, in many, it, 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 it is oftentimes considered to be a, a predictor, okay? And, 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 and historically, I've, I've oftentimes seen people using days to cover as a, as a predictor, as a metric for predicting short squeezes. But I, I have come to the conclusion, I've come to the belief that it's not actually a very good predictor because when you look at what happened with GameStop this last year, the days to cover was actually very low. Uh, the, volume, the volume in the days leading up to that short squeeze was enormous, okay? Uh, and, you know, days to cover is basically the short interest in shares divided by the volume. The volume was enormous and the volume was increasing significantly. And that, that tends to cause the days to cover to plummet. Uh, and so it's kind of, you know, and, and yet there was still a short squeeze. So I don't, I don't think that days to cover is a good predictor anymore of short squeeze, which is why, we, you know, you see a lot of these numbers are really low. We still put it here, but it's not something I, I, I necessarily look at whenever I'm thinking about short squeezes. Um, Okay, let's keep moving on here. Let's go back to AMC. Uh, I'm going to go look at the owners here. And the institutional ownership is something that a, a lot of people look at. We, we actually do this. I believe we actually do this really well. Probably one of the best sites uh, that you can find institutional ownership on. Um, we get this data from public filings, 13Fs, import filings. And we're starting to get these from other exchanges around the world. Um, India and the UK, is, for example. And, and basically what this is saying is that we've got 431 total institutional owners of AMC. 391 of them are long, long only, which means they have a lot, you know, they're owning shares. 14 have a short position, and then 26 of them are kind of long short. Uh, and, and so let's kind of slide down here. You can see the chart of the shares here. Uh, if you'll notice this, AMC is, is actually you know, there's a lot more shares being owned. And this could be from a couple different reasons. It could be from more institutions buying. It could be 
if they issued shares, and I think actually AMC did issue shares uh, that were purchased, okay? So you're gonna see that as potentially a cause of this. Uh, and so this kind of raw chart of shares is not, is not really helpful, but it can kind of give you a pulse. What's really helpful is to take a look at the ownership accumulation score. And what we do here is we, in a kind of like with the short squeeze score, we look at two factors here. We look at the total number of owners that are reporting a position in the company, and we compare it with the prior quarter. So in this case, there are 431 owners, 391 that are long only. So the 391 is, is the important part for us because we're looking for bullish indicators. We're not, we're not interested in looking at people who are short AMC in this, in this number here. And we look at the percentage change in the number of owners. Like so, there's 391 right now, what were their last quarter and, and how many more are there now as a percentage basis? So that's the first factor. And then we look at, not just that, but we look at um, um, the average allocation for each company. Let me, let me get back over here and go to AMC. So we know, for example, that uh, a company might, we know how many shares they have. We know how many, uh, we know how much money they have in their, in their portfolio. We know how much money they've allocated to AMC. What percentage of their total positions is, uh, is, is allocated to AMC? And we look at it for this quarter and we look at it for last quarter. So let's go take a look at the, the, the ownership explorer. Um, this will give you a sense of what we're talking about. And we're gonna, we're gonna skip off AMC here. Let's see, let's see if I can find AMC. In this case, um, we can see that, let's, let's actually just go to the top here because this is gonna be a little bit easier to see because I wanna keep the column headings here. So um, let's take a look at like Sundial Growers. This is a very exciting one, a company for a lot of people. It's a, it's a uh, cannabis company. Um, last quarter, there were 52 owners uh, this closing positions and now there are 150. That's a change of 188 percent. So that's a that's a I would say that's a very bullish indicator. You've got uh, almost 200 almost twice the number of, uh, of, of, of of institutional funds reporting ownership of this company. In addition to that, uh, the average ownership allocation is 0.08 percent. Now that might not seem like a lot, but you know, for mutual funds and for large hedge funds, this you know this can be significant. But the average that that's a that's a change in one thousand three hundred percent compared to the prior quarter. Okay, so what you're seeing is that the companies that were holding last quarter have increased their allocation on average by a thousand percent. So you've got a bunch of companies that are new into the company, and then you've got a bunch of companies that were not new, but but increased their, their allocation by significant amount. And that puts this ownership score at 99%. So I hope that's, I hope that makes sense. Um, the ownership accumulation score is something that we put together because we think it's important for people to be able to understand what the institutional sentiment is. And we think it's a pretty good metric for that. Okay, and this is good not just for, for, for companies like Sundial or for stocks, but you can also look at this for ETFs as well. Um, and, and, and you can also look at this and say, look, uh, here's another cannabis company, right? Where it's just an ETF. And so you might say, look, the ETF business, the ETF industry is becoming more popular with institutions because you're seeing that you know, more and more companies here are are, uh, are getting institutional ownership. Okay, questions about this so far? Not much from you guys, okay. I'll keep going. Um, but this isn't, if, if you're looking for ideas, this is a good place to look for ideas. Um, all right, uh, let's go back to our stock page here. Well, um, well, let's keep going down here to the ownership. So there's 
there's there's 13D and 13G filings. These are basically uh, if a company owns more than five, if not just a company, if anybody owns more than five percent of a company, they have to file a 13D or a 13G. So this is going to show you, uh, you know, the list of companies that have significant positions in in a, in a company. And then here's the full filings here, uh, uh, based on most recent file date. Um, in this case, you have a uh, you have a lot. Okay, you have a lot of green here. Green is is there if it's a new position. And you can slow down, keep going. And when you get to the bottom, you'll find out that there are, you should see the full 581 entries. We have entries here for people who sold out. So uh, this is going to be, you know, the red is where somebody sold out. Um, all right. And then if you want, you know, we have a lot of really interesting data here, uh, including the average share price <clears throat> that we've calculated, <clears throat> the shares, the volume, the portfolio allocation um, and the cost basis and so forth. And then if you want to get more information on that, like on the history, you can click on this little link button here and it's going to give you the full history of, of kind of this, this fund or this institution, the full history of their holdings in AMC. You can see this goes back a couple of years and it shows you kind of when they started off with six, six and zero and 40 so, and so forth so this is helpful if you want to understand like if somebody's been a long-term holder of a, of a fund or of a company um okay now in terms of insiders we have a lot of really interesting insider data um a, a corporate insider is basically a a uh a, 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 an officer like a ceo or a vice president um, an employee of the company. Uh, it could be a board member uh, uh, or they could be a 10% owner of the company or it could be any three, right? The CEO could be a CEO, an officer, he could be a director and he could be a 10% owner. For example, Mark Zuckerberg, I think probably fits all three of those. Um, insiders are, are, are not prohibited from trading in their own shares. They're allowed to buy and sell their own shares or their own companies. They have to disclose everything within two days. Every trade that has to be disclosed, and and they disclose those uh, in an SEC form, uh, three or four or five, right? So, we get all those from the SEC, and we look at them, uh, and and we say, okay, let's take a look at 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 all these form fours, and let's see if we can tease out any information. Now, there's a lot of academic research that says insiders tend to to, to beat the market when trading in their own shares. And that shouldn't come as a surprise. Um, they're allowed to try to buy their shares if they think the company's going to do well. They're allowed to sell their shares if they think the company is not going to do well. But if they have material non-public information, then they are not allowed to trade. So what is material non-public information? Material non-public information is, for example, if they know that they have their quarterly numbers and the quarterly revenue numbers, and they are looking at them and they know that they are not going to meet their estimates, that that is material non-public information. Um, you know, how do you enforce this? I don't know how to enforce this, but the SEC has an enforcement division and they enforce it as best they can. Now, that said, okay, let's take a look at what we can find out here. So we look at the insider data and we try to tease out insights. Uh, one of the things that I think is important is looking at the total number of insiders who are buying or selling, right? If there's a lot of insiders buying, then that's good. Uh, if there's a lot of insiders selling, then that's bad. In the case of AMC, 12 insiders sold shares of AMC in the last 90 days. So on a scale of zero to 100, that puts it in the 0.04. That's probably one of the, look, it's at the very, very, very bottom of the list. Of 21,539 companies that we have, uh, uh, AMC has had more insider sales than than, than most of them, okay? Um, likewise, the percentage of float bought by insiders or sold by insiders uh, is significant, okay? Uh, this ranks, this, this, if this number is bigger, then it's better. These numbers are both pretty small, so these are both really kind of bearish indicators here. Um, and, and that might say to you, look, if there's 12 insiders buying in the last 90 days, and that might mean that the insiders think that that 
this is a good time to sell. I'm sorry, if there's 12 insiders selling in the last 90 days, you might think this is a good time for, in, that this insiders believe this is a good time to sell, okay? That's how you interpret this. Um, we can also take a look at the track records of insider purchases or sales. So we look at all of the buys and all the sales of, 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 of all the open market buys and all the open market sales of every insider. And we say, okay, um, how, what was the performance at that time? So let's take a look at, uh, at um, Adam Aaron on, on uh, September 14th, 2017. He bought 35,000 shares at a price of $15. that cost him $552,000. Within 365 days, the price was $20. So he made a profit of 100 this is a theoretical profit of $150,000. That would have been a return of 27%. That's not bad, right? So you can take this chart. If you were to plot from September 14th, 2017 through 365 days, you would see the, st the performance chart. So here's um, here you can see we're plotting at day zero. And this is 20 days after the trade. This is 40 days after the trade, 60 days after the trade. You can see that of all of these insiders here, Adam, Jack, Kevin, Adam, 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 all these trades, in general, you can see an upward sloping trend on all of these trades, which would suggest that they've all done a pretty good job. You know, in some cases, this guy made a, a theoretical gain of 40%. This one was about 25%, so forth. Um, you see how this works, right? You can also do the same thing with the sales. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people right here sold all in the beginning of June. Um, now it's a little early to see if these are going to be hugely successful, but at this point, you know, the share price has gone down significantly since these trades. Uh, this guy, Stephen managed to avoid losing 25%. So we look at we look at loss avoidance when it comes to a sale. So they sold at $60. The um, this might be the current this actually might be the current price at this point, $45. So he avoided losing at this point so far $39,000 or 25% of his of his investment. You can see here uh, the chart um, of these trades. Okay, does this does this make sense to everybody? What we're doing here. Okay, good. <clears throat> this is important, right? I mean, it's like you want to know which insiders are doing well and which ones are not. At the end of the day, we know that insiders beat the market. Probably not all of them, but 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 in general, as a as a whole, they do, and so which ones do well and which ones don't. And this is, this is what we're looking at, right? You can see the history as well. Um, if I wanted to go in and look at the actual form itself, I can click on four and I can actually see if you have any questions about what they wrote in the form, in the filing, then you can see it here. Now, where does it, where does, what is kind of the next level of this? Well, the next level of this is we're trying to identify all of the insiders who do the best. Okay, so we can see that this guy made a 27% return. Let's go click on Adam, Adam Aaron, where'd he go? He's, he's, okay, here we go. Let's go click on him. Let's take a look at this. Now, now he's, he's, this is his, his page. And we can see that he has, uh, he's, he's bought, these are all of his, his purchases. We can see that these are his, his chart over here. And we can see that he, he's done pretty well. Overall, uh, all of his purchases have made a profit, okay? Um, and then we can see the full history here. Now, the, then the question is, is like, if, is if we're tracking in the, the individual performance of insiders, which insiders are doing the best? That's the obviously next question, right? So that's what we're working on right now. And this is still in development. But if you go over here to the most profitable insiders, actually, before I do that, um, I told you about the short squeeze score, and I told you about the ownership accumulation score. Uh, now we're creating, we've created scoring models similar to those for insider trading as well. 
So in this case, uh, uh, we have a ranking, uh, the top 250 companies, and we rank them based on the number of insiders that are buying and the percentage of float that is, that is being bought by the insider. So if you're looking to use insider trading as a, as a factor in your investment strategy, we provide you with a, a, a nice little chart here or a nice little table that shows you companies at this point, companies that are being most accumulated by their insiders, okay? Um, so there's this, and you can get to this page by going to the Explore latest insider trades or by going to screens and then the highest insider buying scores. Now, in addition to that, this is called top algo picks. It's, maybe it's not the best name. We also look at insider buying. I'm sorry, officer buying. Now, if you think about the insiders, what time is it? It's 11.30. <clears throat> if you think about the insiders, I, I said to you that there are three types of insiders, right? There's officers, there's uh, board members, and then there's 10% owners. Well, when I've done my research on this, what I've discovered is that you find that 10% owners and oftentimes board members are, uh, are, are run funds or they're hedge funds or they're, they're basically managing directors of funds of pooled investment vehicles where they're managing other people's money. Okay, now look, managing other people's money is a big responsibility, uh, but if you're managing your own money or you're spending your own money, it's a much, you're, much, you're going to be much more, at least in my opinion, uh, frugal about that. You're gonna be much more uh, uh, careful about that. So what we're doing here on this page is we're looking at officers because officers are the vice presidents and the CEOs of the company and they are generally not, as a, as a rule, investing other people's money. They're spending their own money to buy shares of the company. And so this officer buying table here is gonna give you a list of all the companies that are being accumulated by officers. So in this case, ODT has got one buyer Okay, that's, okay, that's all right. He spent $57 million in the last year buying share prices at an average price of $14. <coughs> price has since been, has dropped significantly since then. But you kind of get a sense of like, okay, well, you know, this is a, this is a pretty big, uh, uh, in my opinion, a pretty big statement if someone's gonna spend Okay, $57 million. You can get further down here. You can say, look at, here's three, here's three officers. Virgin Group Atlantic acquisition, okay. Um, here's five officers, Tupperware Brands. Uh, they've spent $2 million at a price of $26, and the share price is currently 20% down from, from this purchase price. So ultimately, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to provide a very pure form of, of this. The question is, which is a better page to use? Top also, top algo picks or officer buying page. My preference right now is the officer buying because like I said, I, I believe officers are spending their own money in general. Obviously, if someone's got $57, $57 million, they have money to throw around, but not everybody has $57 million. If you dig around in here, you know, here's a here's a company, Array Technologies, where seven officers, seven different officers have spent $10 million to buy shares at $22 a share. And the share price is now 38% lower. So to me, I believe that to be a very bullish signal, okay, at the end of the day. Uh, uh, and if you were to dig in here and look into this, you might, you might find out who those officers are that are buying um, and, and, and kind of get more information about that. So that's, that's kind of my, my feeling on that. Um, um, and again, you can use them both as kind of a, a, a kind of a, a, a tool, right? I, I don't ever recommend using one simple, one single metric as, as your sole strategy, but I do believe that these are all helpful. Okay, now um, we have it's ten, it's eleven forty two. Any questions so far? Oh, 
I don't mean to be rude. Where do these officers get money to invest? 200 million, I don't know. So I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, in many cases, I mean, let's just take a look at Odinate Therapeutics. We might find that, that um, what, what was this purchase here? Let's, let's, take, let's go down here. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Craig Johnson, where did, where did he, he spent, this isn't a really good example, but I, I, I don't know, I don't know where that is. I don't know the answer to your question. What I, what I have found is that sometimes you find, um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of officers necessarily were, were, were perhaps entrepreneurs prior, uh, but it's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, I, like I said, I try to, I try to make this as pure a form as I can, uh, but I can't necessarily rule out people who are borrowing money to, to buy these shares. Um, I don't know the answer to your question. There. The, the question you're asking here is, have they sold lots of shares six months ago, then used the money to buy shares six months later? Are they doing pump and dump? I, I don't know. I can't tell from this metric, but if you want, you should be able to find all the evidence in on these pages because we do have uh, all of the transactions in here. So that would be part of your due diligence, right? If you see a bunch of buying, uh, then then go back and look to see if they were doing a lot of selling. Um, but you know, if somebody sold a year ago or six months ago and they're buying now, you know, they believe the company is going to go up. You can use that information, right? If you you, you might come to the conclusion that they're doing a pump and dump, but you know, maybe not. You know, um, it, it, what's the is it a pump and dump if they really believe the price is going to go up? You can't really distinguish that, right? I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, I hope that helps. I don't, I don't know if I'm being helpful or not, but I, I hope that, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a thin line here. Um, any other questions then? Um, we have an ownership accumulation score. It's right here. Um, my opinion matters. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I think that if you have a company that is like Odinate Therapeutics, uh, What's the market cap of Odinate? Uh, uh, it's, let's see what it is here. It's $144 million. You know, it, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that you typically, like, I, I don't know anything about Odinate, or to be honest. You know, I, I wouldn't be able to, to, to render an opinion about whether or not it's a good company or whether it's a pump and dump. But in my opinion, if I see that there are a bunch of insiders buying shares. Well, in this case, it's just one. But you know, if, if you see a company where you have a bunch of insiders buying shares, significant amount of money, then to me, that means that the insiders believe that the company is going to go up in value because they wouldn't spend fifty-seven million dollars if they on, on shares on the open market. Okay, if they didn't believe that. That's that's kind of my opinion. Now it doesn't mean that it is going to go up. They could be wrong, but you're really looking at trying to understand what the officers believe and how how much conviction do they have in these opinions and how much money are they putting behind it and how many of them are putting money behind it. That's what you're looking for, right? You're looking for a large number of buyers of other officers and a lot of money, their own money, and that's how you can understand like. What is the in, the officer? What do the officers believe? So that's that's kind of how I look at it, um, and and I think it's I think it's powerful. At, at the end of the day, I think it is actually really a really powerful indicator. I hope that helps. Um, so so yes. Anyway, so I hope that's helpful. Any other questions then? Um, I'll tell you one other thing that we're working on here, and and, and then I'll I'll call it a day. Um, we're 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 putting together a a um, a list of the most profitable insiders. I'm a little hesitant to, sh to show you guys what it is right now because some of the numbers are kind of wacky, so I won't I won't um I won't actually go there right now. One of the things that we're look looking at right now is we're trying to say, okay, of all the insiders that have made trades in the in the last three years, who which of them have been the most profitable? Um, and, and 
what we're finding is some really interesting information here. We're finding that that we that that there's a lot of insiders that are really profitable, and they've made a lot of trades, and they do really well. And and ultimately, what we're trying to find is uh, is there a way to track these like mostly profitable insiders and to be alerted whenever they make trades next. And and that's what we're working on. Now we're still ironing out some of the details. Um, you know, we've got to deal with things like stock splits and stuff like that. But but. But pretty soon here, we're going to have a really great product that's going to allow you to, uh, we'll be able to put kind of like, you know, not just is there a one buyer that's that's buying, but how profitable has that buyer's trades been in the past and use that as a kind of a, a, um, a factor in this as well. If there's a, if there's a buyer that is buying shares, but he has historically lost money every time he bought shares, then maybe it wouldn't be so valuable to, to, to look at this guy. But if there's an officer or two officers or three officers that are buying shares and all of their trades in the last three years have become have been very profitable, then maybe it would be interesting to look at that. Okay. And so that's what I'm trying to, to kind of work on right now is to try to build a, a, a model that looks at the overall historical insider profitability and allows you to see the kind of the, the record of those insiders um, alongside these these buys. So that's that's kind of what that's that's kind of next next up. Um, the question is: Are you putting this seminar on YouTube so that we can review it again? Yes, this is going to go on YouTube. I'll actually show you where to go. If you do a search for YouTube, um, uh, Fintel webinars, uh, you'll find our channel here. Um, you can click on any of these here and you'll see that I've got a bunch of old. Okay. Okay. And we actually have a channel. Uh, all of the old webinars are up there. We have some stock screening webinars. We have some tutorials on insider trading. Um, so I, I would suggest you go out there and take a look at it. And I don't always cover the same stuff <clears throat> on every, on every webinar. So, uh, take a look at some of the old ones. And obviously, you know, if you like this, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, and, um, you know, you'll get notified whenever I, I put some new stuff up. Okay. So it's 1149. If you don't have any more questions, I'll go ahead and, and, and pack it up. Um, I really enjoyed this. Thank you guys for, for, for joining me today. And, um, you know, hopefully I'll see you on, on some comments from you on YouTube and, uh, you know, maybe we'll answer some questions for you guys again in the future. All right. Let's go ahead and stop the share. All right. Thanks so much. Take care.